Happy Thursday, everybody. Pastor Rob here, uh, doing part number 27 in our study with Mark. I hope everybody's doing good. Again, thank you for subscribing and thank you for liking videos. I appreciate that. Um, the more uh, more support I get, the more we grow and the more people we can reach, I hope. And uh, just trying to give simple studies on the book of Mark. And uh, if you're with me today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 11. Again, remember the divisions in the Bible that you see are um, put there by man. So I like to divide them up a little differently sometimes. And right here, uh, Jesus fed the 4,000. And then he meets opposition from the Pharisees. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at bread. We're going to go into the understanding of what Jesus really means and what his intentions are by feeding the masses, how he uses the disciples, why he used the disciples, and the importance of the multiplication of the bread, which we're going to find out is his word. He is the, the bread of life in uh, John chapter 6, and the bread that we are spreading is the word of God. We need to get it to the masses of people, and um, that's our job, and uh, that's what he's referring to. When he's talking about the bread, that's, he's hoping that we have a deeper discerning understanding of that. So with that, starting number, uh, lesson number 27, Mark chapter 8, verse 11. So they fed the 4,000, and in verse 11 it says, The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. They're testing him. They don't like him. They see him as a threat. And they ask him for a sign from heaven. It doesn't matter. There are people in this world that you can do things for and you could do a miracle and no matter what happens they're not going to believe these pharisees know that jesus is the christ they want to see a miracle for him to prove it and but they know who he is because they've studied it they're well studied they know the bible they just don't want to accept it because it's kind of like um when you invite people to church or you hire a pastor or something like that if he's not the prototypical pastor, not the prototypical guest that comes to your church, you know, you just they just get rejected. He's not the type of Messiah they're looking for. They're looking for a war Messiah, somebody to come in, defeat the Romans, be grateful to the Pharisees, and promote them to the highest places of leadership once he takes over the country. So that's not going to happen. Uh, they're disappointed. And they're upset because he's drawn crowds of people. So they came to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. Again, it would have been a worthless sign. They don't want to believe anyway. They're just trying to mess with Jesus. So verse 12, he sighed deeply. He groans. He's like, oh my gosh, you guys, you know, I know you know who I am. Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? Which is interesting because he's healed people with leprosy. He, healed, he fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. He's healed the blind. He's healed the deaf. Still, they don't believe. It doesn't matter what they do or what he does. They're never going to believe. And as I said before, if you're talking to a person like that, that just enjoys argument, walk away. You're wasting your time. Just walk away. Find somebody that genuinely wants to hear the word of God and talk to that person. Because there are people out there that really genuinely want to know who Jesus is. And they need help understanding the Bible. So he sighs deeply. Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them and got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. But I want to say something here. Matthew and Luke both have a different, not a different thing, but they add on to what Jesus said. No sign will be given you, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And if you go to Matthew chapter 16... What you're going to see here is the same instance. The Pharisees are testing him and they're asking him for a sign from heaven. And Jesus says, in accordance with what we were just looking at in Mark chapter 8, uh, he replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. You know, it's got red skies at night, sailors delight. Still uh, applicable to today. And people in the Navy that I know actually uh, use that. Uh, it will be fair weather when the sky is red, and in the morning uh, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And this is God's perfect divine timeline. Jesus came in the perfect time. They know it, 
they refuse to believe it. They don't want to believe it because he's not who they think he should be. And in Galatians 4, 4, we know that Jesus came in God's perfect timing. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. And Jesus left them and went away. So Mark stops and says, no sign will be given to you and leaves and goes away. But uh, Matthew and Luke agree that Jesus said that the sign of Jonah. Now, it's not explained here in Matthew as I saw it. But if you go to Luke, it's important that we know that in this portion of scripture that this continues. It doesn't end right here. And so in Luke chapter 11, verse 29 um, Luke actually explains the sign of the prophet jo Jonah in greater depth. So when you look at all three Gospels, you get the complete story. So Luke chapter 11, verse 29, As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asked for a miraculous sign, but none will be given to it except the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be assigned to this generation. Uh, people knew that Jonah was a prophet, and people should know that this is the Messiah. But even today, as in then, people still don't want to accept Christ as the Lord and Savior or Messiah. It's still the same battle. Uh, that uh, So anyway, no sign will be given but the prophet Jonah. Verse 31 of Luke chapter 11. The queen of the south will rise at judgment with men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, well, the wisest man to ever live. And now one greater than Solomon is here. So she came from the ends of the earth to see Solomon, and here I am right in front of you, and you still don't believe, Jesus is saying. So she's going to stand in judgment over you. She went at great lengths to get to Solomon, and here I am, and you don't accept me. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment against this generation and condemn it. For the people of Nineveh, who were just heinous, wicked people, I, I, I know things, I studied some of that. The Ninevites were wicked, real wicked. And Jonah went to them and preached uh, 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed, and they repented. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. And as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, the Lord will be three days in the belly of the earth, and he will rise again. So that's the sign that's coming, that did come, and was in front of them, and they refused to accept it. So when he says he left them in, in uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 13, right in there is when Matthew and Luke come in and talk about the prophet Jonah. So let's keep going. Verse 14, the disciples had, so they go on, they cross the other side of the lake, and the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf of bread. And they had that with them in the boat. And so Jesus sees this, and this is, a, as a leader would say, this is a teaching opportunity. He warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. In other words, they're peddling, and what he'll explain here in a minute, the yeast is a false gospel. It's false truths. It's false religion. It's the same thing that we deal with today. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still see and not understand? Or do your heart, why are your hearts so hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? That's very true. How many people really listen, um, but they don't really hear what you're saying? You know, they're listening, but they're not they're really paying attention. They have auditory exclusion. You know, that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, guys, you need to be more discerning. What I'm doing and everything I'm doing is for teaching. It's for application. And he's upset that they're not picking up on his teachings. So don't you remember? So you don't. You, so let me go back. I'm sorry. Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? You're not understanding me. I've had my wife tell me that before. You're not listening to me. You're not paying attention. Yes, I'm guilty. So... He goes into this and gives them, has them think, as a leader should. Hey, guys, think a minute. What we did, what we've been, what we've been through. Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets of pieces, uh, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? And they remembered. Twelve. He's testing them. He's teaching them. 
And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets fulls uh, did I pick up? And they answered, seven. And he said to them, why don't you understand? They're not understanding that Jesus is able to provide for them. Why are you worried about bread? I'm right here. I can make a million loaves of bread if I have to. You guys are still focused on the bread. But what he really wants them to be focused on is his teaching. The bread, and Jesus is the bread of life. Let's look at that, by the way, because uh, I think that would benefit us right here. Um, let's go to John chapter 6, and we'll start at verse 32. Jesus is going to say he's the bread of life. And so this is significant to this part of the teaching. Jesus said to them in John 6, 32, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the people respond, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. Look, at we do this with Jesus today too. All they're worried about here is eating. They just want some food. They want bread. They're not, and so many people go to Jesus for things just to pour on themselves. They don't want any part of Jesus. They want the benefits of knowing Jesus. But we, we, we need to come after Christ with a, with a fervor, and we want Christ in our life. We want to worship him, and we want to, you know, honor him as Lord. And they said, sir, give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. So here we have it explained. Why does he take the bread and break it and give it to the disciples to, to, to uh, give to the people? Because that's what he's doing with us today. The bread is the word. Jesus Christ was the bread of life. The, he is the word. And the word that we have is the bread to pass out to other people. The word is the Bible. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. The word was with God. And he came down to the earth. And now we have the bread of life, which is the word of God written for us. And we're to take that. We're to break that. We're to pray over that. And we're to distribute this to mankind. Tell people about Christ Jesus. He is the bread of life. John 6, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. Now, he's speaking spiritually. If you want to be satisfied, if you want to know where you came from, where you're going in life, what your destiny is like, where uh, morality came from, all these things. If you are an inquisitive mind and you're searching the world for answers, you will never be dissatisfied by reading the Word of God. As a matter of fact, you will be satisfied. When he fed the people, the fish and the loaves, they were satisfied. They were no longer hungry. You can picture somebody at turkey dinner, Thanksgiving morning. What does your dad do, your grandpa do? They go, they chow down. They go get in their lazy boy recliner on the couch, flick on the TV, watch some football, and put their hand on their belly going, yeah, way to go. I'm, I'm full. That's the way Jesus is with the bread. That's the way he is with his word. If you want to be satisfied, if you want to know more about life and truths about life, read the word of God and you'll always be satisfied. Now, you may have questions. That's what preachers are for. Um, so ask somebody that's spiritually mature if you have questions. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. They'll be satisfied. The word of God is satisfying, knowing that you're resting in Christ's arms. That's satisfying. There's, there's, there's hope there. There's protection there. There's an understanding. There's contentment in Christ Jesus. But verse 36 of John 6, But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. Why do you want a miraculous sign? You still do not believe. Why? They don't want to believe. That's the way the world is today. Well, um, thanks for telling me about Jesus, but I'll get there on my own. You will not. The only way you're getting to heaven is through Jesus Christ. I tell people the most important decision out of all the decisions you have to make in life is will I or will I not believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior? That's the biggest decision you ever have to make. It's the only one that follows you into eternity. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So if you come to Christ, he's not going to drive you away. He accepts everyone. No one is. He is non-discriminatory. If you want to experience non-discrimination with a Savior, Jesus Christ says, I will never push anybody away. So come as you are. Come you don't have to do one thing, but come to him and say, God, here I am. I'm giving you what I have, my life. Please take my life and do something with it. 
and you find value in serving Christ. Whoever the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall not lose uh, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. So all the people, he, anybody that comes to Christ for salvation, God is giving them to him. And so uh, I will raise them up at the last day. What's interesting about that? You come to Christ, you get saved, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And he says, I will raise them up at the last day. You know what that means? There's going to be someday a last day. And, and hopefully by then you already know Christ is your savior. Verse 40 of John 6, for my will is that everyone, everyone, there's people out there that believe there are only certain people going to heaven or only so many, or just the elect are going to heaven. Everyone who looks for the Son and who believes in Him will have eternal life. Now, Calvinism likes to tear that apart and say, no, 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 it's only for the elect. God only gives Him the elect. Listen, there is no elect. You either believe in Christ and every person on this planet that breathes air has a choice to make whether to believe him or not to believe him. John chapter 12 also says, when I am lifted up, it doesn't say I'm going to draw the elect unto me. And John chapter 12, when it says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I am not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, not the elect. It's anybody. Jesus Christ hopes that every man will come to him and see him as Lord and Savior. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. So there is a dividing line. You either believe or you don't believe in Christ Jesus. If you believe, he will raise you up. You will go to heaven. You will be with him forever in paradise. If you don't believe in him, you've made that decision to let yourself go to hell. You've said, no, nope, I'm not taking that free gift. I'm not taking that free ride, that free ticket. I'm not putting my faith in you. I'll just go ahead and do my own thing. And your own thing is going to lead you directly to, the, to hell, unfortunately. So I only say that because I hope that everybody gets right with God. I got to do a funeral this week on Wednesday. And literally, I had to ask, you know, hey, is your, what was your wife saved before she passed? And the guy's like, I really don't know. And I'm like, man, you, when I come to the funeral, can I give a salvation call to ask people? Because now they're deciding, we're never going to get out of here alive. None of us. None of us are getting out of here alive. We've got to be ready to meet our maker. So uh, he gave me that permission to preach the gospel at the funeral of his wife. And I pray that she is in heaven. I'm not her judge. I don't know. So that's between her and God. So hopefully she's in heaven. And, uh, you know, when, when you go to heaven, you say, good night. You're not saying goodbye, you know, because we'll see each other again. So anyway, Mark chapter 8, that's where we're at. Um, he fed the 4,000. Then the Pharisees challenged him. And then Jesus explains that he is the bread of life. Please remember to tie in Matthew 16, Luke 11, and John chapter 6 with this lesson. Because they all give a greater vision and a greater um you know picture of what's really happening here when they ask for a sign the sign that will be given is the sign of jonah he will be a prophet jesus is a prophet going around preaching the gospel he is god obviously but then he will be in the the earth as jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and then he will rise again and that will be the sign and, and basically he's saying believe it or don't believe it that's the only sign you're getting so Anyway, I hope everybody has a great day. That's the end of this lesson. We'll pick up tomorrow uh, around uh, 822, Mark 822. And um, if you have any questions, reach out. Please subscribe and like. And any, any prayer requests, I'll be happy to pray for or even with anybody if I can help somehow. So have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.